Bill Doyle on Vermont Issues, and uh, with me is Sophie Kirsten, and uh, we'll do that, doing it together. And uh, yeah, how, tell us something about yourself and how I, how okay. you, I sure. make sure I pronounce your name correctly. Okay. It's Avram. I'm Avram Pat. Yeah. Uh, I live in Worcester, and uh, I'm, uh, we're, we're talking about some energy issues today, and I think the reason I'm here is because uh, I was involved, I still am, but I was involved in my work for many, many years on energy issues. Uh, for about 16 years, uh, I was the general manager of Washington Electric Co-op. Uh, I retired in 2000, middle of 2013, and before that, it, I worked in state government uh, where I dealt with uh, running the uh, low-income weatherization program and also a lot to do with um, energy fuel assistance, helping people pay for uh, energy who can't afford to. Um, so that's my, uh, that's my background. Like I said, I, I retired from the co-op job and I did spend two years uh, uh, in the legislature as well and I'm running for office again, so. Good. Uh, in the House. Can I call you Avram? Hmm? Avram? Avram? Avram. Avram, okay. Yeah. I want to make sure. Oh, people call me either one and uh, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> I'm used to it. Well, we've had a one long and productive relationship between the two of us and, and I admire what you've done with yeah. your life. Thank you. And you know and an awful lot of... to you, Bill. We're here to talk about net metering, so why don't, why don't we just start off by saying what is net metering? Explain what net metering and why it's important. Okay. Uh, net metering is one way uh, of generating renewable energy. Um, it is uh, where the uh, individual or groups of customers of a utility put up some very small scale renewable energy generation uh, uh, at their home or their business. Um, and the energy that's generated uh, by that uh, is credited against their bill um, so that they actually um, uh, in effect are, are, are selling back renewable energy uh, to, to the utility. It's very important, and I'll, I'll get to this later, that this, this is very much integrated and connected with the utility grid because it's always been possible, not always, but since we've had solar panels for someone to be off-grid to not be, have be a utility customer at all. Net metering is where you're connected to the grid. The economics and how it gets paid for is very much tied to being connected to the grid and the utility. Uh, in, it's mostly, almost entirely solar. Um, uh, and I just looked up some numbers the other day. In Vermont right now, there are um, over 6,800 um, net metering customers who are uh, uh, generating power through so solar panels. Um, and there's only, uh, you can also um, net meter with small scale wind, of uh, uh, small, sm much smaller towers, farm methane or even uh, small scale hydro. But there's really uh, maybe a little bit over um, uh, 200 of those different types uh, across the whole state, whereas uh, solar is um, by far the most popular and in the last few years has the number of people has, has grown very dramatically. Uh, it's also possible um, to do what's called group net metering. If someone doesn't have a good site um, or doesn't own a, a, good, a good site, uh, either on their roof or their land, um, they can be part of a group that is net metering from a somewhat larger project with many solar panels. So let's say 30 different people um, are getting a piece of the generation from this one, uh, one project. Uh, those are ones that you typically, if you're driving by them, you'll see a field with a lot of solar panels um, and that's, that's serving um, a, a larger number of, uh, of customers. Are those set up by the electric companies? No, uh, those are, uh, although there are some electric companies that have built their own generating, uh, uh, solar generating. There are, there are uh, quite a few um, 
companies in Vermont, mostly Vermont-based, not entirely, um, that uh, uh, are in the business of um, uh, putting up solar uh, panels uh, and, in, and in some cases offering people uh, uh, financing mechanisms that allow them uh, to get involved in net metering without having to put money up, up front. It which can was be expensive. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's, it's expensive to buy the equipment and, and install it, and in, in the past, um, that was a stopper for, for a lot of people. They either had to have the money or be able to take out a loan uh, in a pretty large amount. Um, now some companies offer a, uh, a, a different way of getting, just starting to um, uh, be involved without having to put money up front. Um, so mm -hmm. that make, makes it much easier. But um, it, it is uh, private, you know, businesses, devel developers that are, that are um, uh, selling uh, a product and the installation of, of, the, of the system. Can you tell us something about your legislative experience? Excuse me? Uh, are you running for the legislature? I am running for the legislature. Uh, and uh, what do you hope to, cop to accomplish? Hmm? What do you hope to accomplish as a legislator? Yeah. What do I? What do you hope? To, to accomplish, to accomplish yeah. okay. Well, uh, uh, just uh, so, so, uh, I am interested in continuing uh, to see that Vermont um, uh, try uh, attempt really pushes to achieve its goals of of, of significantly more renewable energy uh, than we have now. We're we're already somewhat of a leader nationally in that, but we're not where where we should be. Uh, my other issues have to do with. Uh, uh, economic fairness and taxes and things like that and in he health care is, is the issue that uh, I've cared about since uh, uh, my father who was a f uh, old school family doctor talked to me about about it when Medicare was first started mm. back in the 1960s so mm. well, Sophie and I thank you for being with us today oh okay. Bill we still have yeah. some questions yeah well I, I just want to say start with thank you for being here thank oh. you I agree to be here Okay. And uh, thank you for your, your, your past service and your future service. Thanks, Bill. So uh, let's talk about net metering, which is bringing us together, and how much is, is there in Vermont, and can anybody yeah. be a net, net meter? Well, we, yeah, I did mention some of that, so I think I'll talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of this kind of small-scale net metering compared to some of the big projects. Um, uh, the advantage of um, uh, net metering, which like I said a few minutes ago, is almost entirely solar, is that you can put up solar panels almost anywhere. You can put them on your roof if it's facing in the right direction. You can put it on a pedestal in your yard. You can put it in a neighbor's yard. You can have a group of people put up panels together. Uh, and they can go um, almost anywhere where there's uh, enough um, daylight exposure. Um, and uh, the other advantage in this kind of arrangement is that the, um, the utility customers, the people using the electricity, actually have a, a strong sense of connection to um, the fact that the energy they're using um, is renewable. They have the connection because there are the panels out right on their roof or in, you know, out in, in their yard. Um, it's, and it's something that they did rather than it just being d delivered to them. And I think for a lot of people that, uh, that's important. Um, the disadvantage compared to very large um, solar farms that take up you know, lots of fields and lots and lots of acres, or um, uh, wind projects, which in Vermont, as we know, are uh, huge towers. They have to be put on um, on ridge line because that's where the wind is, um, and they're vis very, very visible. Uh, whether it's a wind project or a very large solar project, they're very, very visible. Um, all of these things have an environmental impact of, of some kind. They use they use land, they require construction. But um, a, a large commercial scale wind project, even though it's visible from miles away, um, uses far less land on the ground for the same amount of, 
of electricity produced. So, so um, uh, I'm familiar from my past work with the Sheffield Wind Project that Washington Electric Co-op takes a, a piece of the power from. And that has 14 of those giant towers. Um, um, but the uh, total amount of land taken up by that project on the ground itself is 26 acres. And to generate the same amount of electricity from solar panels, you would need, uh, at least when I calculated this about eight or 10 years ago, um, you would need three or 400 acres of solar panels, just, just the panels themselves. Mm. So um, that's the advantage that's and disadvantage that I, that I see. Um, uh, large projects can be controversial in citing them. Small, someone putting up solar panels on their roof or in their yard is usually not controversial. Um, and so those are, I think that those are the ad advantages and disadvantages. You can gener generate a lot more electricity with a lot less space with a big project at a lower cost, um, um, but you don't have the kind of personal connection to it, uh, and you are going to run into uh, controversies around siting um, and, and maybe build, having to build new transmission lines to get to the project and things like that. I'd like yeah. to thank, also thank uh, Sophie Christian for being here today. Oh, Bill. And, and, uh, and please, you have the first question. Well, I'm curious about public resource. So yeah. as a town, like Barry put in a couple of these solar fields in the yeah. last few years, and I'm wondering if that was a municipal project for the community to, you know, bolster its resources, or if it was privatized within the community, or if it's just completely um, of its own. I, I don't know specifically about, mm -hmm. about those projects. I'll give you an example, though. There is a, um, uh, a project being considered in Worcester, where I live now, and I went to a meeting about it. Um, and uh, w one of the um, things that would happen if this gets built is that the um, uh, public facilities, the municipal and school buildings in town, would be getting a piece of that electricity. Not Immediately. Uh, well, right. they would be more generated than those buildings use so that uh, it would be sold to other customers um, as well. So in Barry, I don't know, uh, that could be a gr group net metering projects, it could be commercial. I haven't read just in the news that th that Barry, that, that municipalities the, the, the are municipality doing is actually the developer of oh, the yeah. project. I don't think that's I the I was case. wondering about that. And in the Worcester project, has the conversation of solar versus wind versus hydro been an issue, or are people just going for, I for think solar? I in, 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 um, in this case, uh, it, it's solar because that's what's doable. There really isn't a, um, uh, a, a larger scale um, wind site available. Um, and the river yeah, isn't it, wide it, enough for something right no, there? No, the, the river, the, it's the north branch of the Winooski, which is generating um, electricity a few miles south at the Wrightsville Reservoir, which mm -hmm. is a, a Washington Electric Co-op hydro plant. Um, uh, so while there are some old dams, um, they're really not of a scale that if you wanted to get them back in service, um, I don't think they generate a whole lot of electricity. So the one at Wrightsville, when was that initially created, do you know? Yes, um, uh, the, the dam was built after the 1927 flood right. by the Civilian Conservation Corps, same, same time as the Waterbury Reservoir, more or less, as yep. a, f a flood control to protect Montpelier from that happening again. The, the hydro plant was not put in until the 1980s. Oh. Um, uh, and that was um, uh, originally uh, um, a couple of local hydro pioneers, Matt Rubin and John Warshaw, oh, yeah, okay. who built some, a lot of other facilities, had the rights to that, decided not to develop that one, and so the co-op took it over. And, and, and uh, it's a small plant. And it, has it been running it's since? It's running all, you know, all the time. Yep. Well, before we go any further, I want yep. uh, Sophie Christian to introduce herself. 
Oh, Bill, you're so sweet. Let's get on with the questions. No, Everybody no, no, already no, knows no, me. No, I want, I want you to introduce, <laughs> I want to introduce, you to introduce yourself. Okay. Um, my name is Sophie Bettman Kirsten, and I was born and raised around here, and I am very deeply committed to the health and well-being of this community and those surrounding it, and so it's a great honor to work with Bill in being able to contact and question our local authorities mm -hmm. on things of great interest to all of us. So I want to thank you guys both very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks for being here, Sophie. <laughs> the thanks come from both of us, too. Just talk about net, what is net metering. Well, we, we already went through um, that. I think what I wanted to talk a little bit about is, that is the one area uh, that's been uh, controversial and the sources of some disagreement over the years is exactly how net metering gets paid for because that's been that's changed a number of times um, uh, and I'll, 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 I'll talk a little bit about it the uh, the main the, it used to be very early on that when we described net metering and said what it does um, and this was before people had what we now call smart meters that had the old meters with a disk that spun around um, and what we basically said was when you're net metering, when your solar panels are generating electricity, it's actually spinning the meter the other way and, and um, physically spinning the meter the other way and, and making less and less kilowatt hours showing up on the meter. So to the utility, um, it simply looked like you were using almost no or maybe no electricity. Um, but you're still paying a flat, every utility has a flat, what's called the customer charge uh, uh, that pays for some of the um, fixed costs of the utility. Like $30 a month or something? Uh, well, in, most, in Vermont it's mostly less than that right now, oh, wow. uh, although some are proposing that they need to raise that up a little bit. Can anyone any so, do net, net metering? Can yeah, you? yeah, so uh, over time, uh, uh, with uh, changes in the law and regulations in Vermont, um, instead of it just spinning the meter backwards, a, 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 a financial, a dollar value was actually attached to each kilowatt hour generated and you got a credit of that amount uh, against your bill and it became possible for a while um, to completely zero out your bill, including that flat customer charge and the utilities were saying wait a minute um, this whole system of net metering is dependent on us being here on having the poles and wires up on having line workers go out and put the lines back up after an ice storm and all of those those costs and so there's been a number of changes including uh, one this year um, uh, that affect how much the value, financial value, each kilowatt hour is worth to the customer. And it's gone down a, a little bit, and the, the, um, uh, the people in the business of, of uh, selling net metering who would want to do more of that aren't happy with that. Most of the utilities have been um, on the other side, and the Vermont uh, Public Utilities Commission recently I would say came down somewhat in the middle um, and said, okay, we do, we do need to strike a somewhat different balance financially because it was beginning, because net metering is so popular in Vermont now that it was actually having an impact, a real impact on rates um, and mm -hmm. particularly on people who for whatever reason are not net metering. Um, and. Uh, that's been the balance, and I, I think that uh, for, the, the, for um, utilities in Vermont, the amount of net metering, it varies differently by different utility, but is approaching 15% um, uh, of their uh, peak load, that's, that's how it's measured. When I first, back in 2013, uh, a few months before I left, I wrote a letter to the Public Service Board saying Washington Electric Co-op had passed 
the 4% cap um, that was in law at that point that said a utility shouldn't take more than 4% of its peak load in net metering, and the co-op was the first utility that went past that number. And so that's been raised now uh, up to 15%, and utilities are starting to approach that. So that's great. Th that's, yeah, on the one hand, it's successful. Uh, it pushed, uh, it, uh, having very beneficial um, uh, financial arrangements for the net metering customers certainly helped encourage people to do that. Um, and on the other hand, uh, it, the balance swings the other way and it starts hurting uh, financially uh, in, in, in other ways. So I think that's a, 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 a balance that th this discussion is not, is not over. And, and um, I've had, as someone who worked at a utility, I've had m my opinions, but I can also um, um, effectively argue with the other side of that as well. It's not, it's not either or. It's finding a balance and, and, and probably needing to adjust that over time. You use the phrase zero out the bill. Explain it. Do, how many, do all the customers zero out the bill? Uh, they can't now. It, for a period of time, they could zero out um, both the value of their electric usage, the kilowatt hour charge, as well as the flat customer charge. Now, that's called the, the f customer charge is called a non-bypassable charge, which means you, you have to pay that. Right. And then you get a credit against the energy part um, of, of, of your bill. Um, so that's, um, uh, but it's also complicated because it, the arrangement has changed a few times. So if someone started net metering uh, at a time when this was the uh, payment scheme, they will continue that for a period of time. You can't just yank right. away from them what they signed up for. So you have groups of people who are uh, paying, uh, getting paid in different rate structures depending on when they, they first started par participating. So mm -hmm. Do other states do this? Many other states do, and many the uh, payment arrangements can be different, but it is, um, uh, it, it, it's quite common. I'm not sure whether it's in, in every state. I, do, I don't think it is. <clears throat> I think in some states, the utilities have fought this much more than in Vermont. Why would they fight it? Um, because it was, they saw it as bad for business. And, um, and in, uh, in Vermont, um, uh, utilities are people too, and <laughs> um, I think I think the um, uh, the the attitude and the understanding about the need for um, promoting more renewables was was um, uh, accepted by most of the people in the utilities in Vermont as well. So it only b it becomes an issue of uh, is how we're paying for it fair, or does that need to be adjusted from time to time? Sophie, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Well, it seems that this is a sort of an issue that's happening in several areas, yeah. right? It's happening in cable, television, the transfer yeah. of information, the transfer of electricity or energy. Um, and I'm just, I'm interested in the question about how to maintain the usage, but also how to provide you know, the things that we want to provide as individuals to the communities that have been receiving them without, yeah. you know, there's, losing. Yeah, there's no doubt, and I, I know that people the throughout the utility industry know that um, um, things, the business is changing. It has been changing. It's continuing to change. It's not uh, the old model where you put up lines, you got wholesale sources of electricity, you send it out and people pay and you for get it. Money now, back. now it's much more um, dispersed, decentralized, there's generation happening at people's homes in small, uh, much smaller generators dispersed throughout throughout the system. And how we pay for it is 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 also changing. The other thing that's changing is that for years and years um, we talked about using less electricity. Uh, and Washington Electric Co-op certainly. Um, now, if we want to get off of fossil fuels and stop driving gasoline-driven uh, fueled um, 
uh, cars or using uh, oil for heat, we're electrifying, we're, tell we're encouraging people to do that with electricity. Um, the only issue then is it doesn't do us any good, the climate and the, and the, and the planet, um, unless that electricity is renewable energy. If, right. it's, if the electricity is being generated by uh, coal, coal. <laughs> uh, then, then, then why encourage people to get electric vehicles? If the electricity yeah. comes from um, a combination of their own solar panels and other larger renewable sources, then, then yes, we are definitely doing a good thing by, telling, by encouraging people to, to make that switch. How many people are involved in renewability? In, in Vermont? Yes. Uh, well, the, just in the solar business, I don't have the number, but there's, there's thousands of people now. They, this has become a, a significant new employer, uh, not, not one employer, but the, the a number of businesses, larger and smaller ones throughout, throughout uh, Vermont. And of course, there are people who are um, uh, operating some of the larger facilities, the wind projects and, and, uh, and hydro projects and things like that in Vermont. So it's well, do you see more wind projects coming to Central Vermont or to uh, Vermont in general, or was uh, Sheffield? I think a I stuck my neck nightmare? out when I was at Washington Electric Co-op uh, in the in the middle of the wind energy debate and said things like what I said earlier about there were there were the certain footprint. advantages to this, right. um, but also if we're serious about moving towards renewable energy, then we're going to have to look at it. Um, and we can't avoid for years. Um, if you ask people, and I would ha ask people in, in meetings and forums I went to, where does your electricity come from? And they get, tell me the name of their utility. And I say, no, that's not what I meant. I mean, I know, I know where your utility gets their electricity from, but right. to you, and they, they didn't. It came from a, 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 a outlet in the wall, basically. Right. So if we want, if we, we can't, um, dramatically change where our power comes from if, unless we're willing to accept it uh, in our landscape, provided that it's responsibly developed and done in the right places and, and, and all of that. So I've, I've been a supporter um, of, of uh, wind projects in Vermont, and there aren't that many ridgeline sites in Vermont that are uh, feasible or appropriate and, and near existing transmission lines. You can have a site with great wind, but if it's 20 miles from the nearest transmission line, that's, a, that's not possible. And I, there's nothing on Lake Champlain that would be windy well, enough? No, actually, Lake that's Champlain That's so wild. Is, yeah, <laughs> the wind, if you think about it, the wind, so the wind comes from the west. Mm -hmm. It comes, it hits uh, the Adirondacks and it goes up. And, oh, and so, so when it's over. crossing over Vermont, it's at a high altitude. Mm. And so that's where the, the um, steady, consistent wind is, is, up, is up high, as mm. opposed to if we were in um, South Dakota or West Texas uh, in the flatlands, the wind is coming for over a thousand miles from the Pacific. Right. Um, and, it's, and, and you're out in the, in the prairies and that's where the, that's where the wind is. Now, does Vermont have a goal on renewability? A what? A goal. Where would they, where would they like to I go I don't with remember it? The, the number, but it's a very high goal to reach, not just for electricity, but for all energy uses, including um, transportation and, and heat, um, by 2050. I really don't remember the numbers. But, but it, they have set goals. It, it's very set goals. And actually, the biggest challenge is not in electricity, but it's in transportation, uh, because we're a rural state and people uh, travel uh, in in vehicle in cars uh, long longer distances than uh, and and don't have other ways right now of of getting around other than getting in their car um, and driving there. So that's that the challenge is to change. Uh, the vehicles over gradually to electric vehicles. I noticed, I saw in the news that Central Vermont, uh, the GMTA, the public transit provider, yeah. is getting funding to switch over at least some of their vehicles to electric buses. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's big deal. Yeah, a few years ago, um, electric vehicles, buses were, and trucks were not uh, 
it was not ready for prime time yet to try doing that with larger vehicles. It was Five, six York years City later, it, right. it's, it, it works. And, and it may not be um, ready for prime time on the hill we live on in Worcester yet, but, um, but I have a feeling five years from now, it probably, it probably will be. Things are moving quickly. Sophie, have you had any experience in electric cars? <laughs> Bill and I bought an electric car a year ago. Okay. We've put almost 16,000 miles on it in one year. And it's a great local commuter. Mm -hmm. And so I get about 70 miles distance in a one night's charge. And basically I can go get Bill. We go do our morning projects go have a nice lunch, go home, have a beautiful afternoon, and I can make it home usually without having to charge. Sometimes, maybe once a week, I get stuck where I need to charge before I can get home. Yep. Now you talk about savings? We love it. And I save and about $100 a week in gas. Charging, is the, I also just saw in the news that uh, um, there's some funding, uh, I think Governor Scott... Uh, oh, he a, did, 1.4 million <laughs> yeah. yesterday. For, for, for putting out more charging stations. Charging stations, yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's right now, that's, that's the, uh, uh, the... It's not just charging stations, but there's most charging stations, if you're plugging it at home, you're charging in a very slow kind yeah. of trickle. It's 12 like, hours. Right. And, and people who are traveling can't do that. You need 15-minute yeah, max. Th that's right. <laughs> yeah. you need to, it's like you, you need, we need to get to where it's the equivalent of pulling into a gas station. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and a few minutes later, uh, you leave and, you're, and you, you're you're ready. you can go another 300 miles. Yeah. Um, Any other thoughts, Sophie? No, but I think we're good. Yeah. Right? Do you have some more thoughts on the subject? No, I, questions? That what I have in mind is, is both of us would like to thank you for the work that you do thank and you. for being here today. Thank you. It's good to, uh, you know, I did want to, I meant to say when I was introducing myself, and I'll just say this, that um, any opinions I expressed here are, since I, 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 you know, I learned much of this when I was at Washington Electric Co op, but I am, have not been there for a few years, so the opinions are, are my own, and I'm not speaking for. Uh, 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 the co-op. We appreciate you bringing okay. them to the okay. table okay. as a member of the community okay. then. And a consumer yourself. So that, you know, that part of it I think is fascinating. Any, any further questions? I think we got it. We, thank thank, we both thank you for the work you thank do. You. Thank, thank you, you Avram. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you, Bill, for having us yep. on well, your show. Thanks for setting it up, Sophie. Nah. Okay. It is a pleasure. Thank you.